In my first video about Wen Tingjin, I talked about what he did at a civil service examination. But I did not talk very much about his life. To find out more about Wen Tingjun's life and why he acted the way he did, I did a thorough search on the internet about him and the people who were related to him one way or another, hoping to find some clues about how he became the way he was. I'm Dr. Gao, a philosopher obsessed with poetry. I make videos about the classical Chinese poetry, philosophy, and the traditional Chinese medicine. If you like the content of my videos, please click the like button and subscribe my channel. I also offer online lessons on these subjects. So if you would like to know more about these subjects, please contact me. Here's my email address. Now, let's go back to Wen Tingjun. He was born into an aristocrat family. Many of his forefathers were high-ranked officials in the Tang court. The best known one was Wen Yanbo, a premier of the real founder of the Tang dynasty, Emperor Li Shimin. Li Shimin was celebrated as one of the best emperors in Chinese history. He was not only an excellent general, but also a wise emperor who took criticism graciously which was rather rare among the accomplished emperors. Li Shimin was the one promoted Wen Yanbo to the highest rank of civil service examination as his premier in 636 AD. Wen Yanbo was known not only for his political wisdom and moral integrity, but also for his elegance and handsome appearance. And I have to say, Wen Tingjin did not inherit any of these great qualities. There is no record about Wen Tingjun's father as far as I know. The only thing we know today is that his father died when he was very young, and he was adopted by an uncle named Wen Zhao. This Wen Zhao was also a quite interesting character. During his younger years, Wen Zhao dedicated his life to self-cultivation and retreated to Wang Wu Mountain. By the Tang Dynasty, Wang Wu Mountain was already a famous Taoist resort, boasting the grandest Taoist temples. Many of the royal members retreated there to practice Taoism, including Princess Yi Zhen. Princess Yi Zhen was the one recommended the great poet Li Bai to Emperor Li Longdi. So, my suspicion is that Wen Zhao's retreat to Wang Wu Mountain might be a shortcut to officialdom. He was later recruited by the local governor who also married his daughter to him. This was how Wen Zhao started his political career. In 830 AD, Wen Zhao led an army defeated a rebellion in Shanxi province and was promoted to the position of the deputy minister at the military department. Five years later, he was promoted again as the minister of the Department of Right, which was in charge of all the royal ritual ceremonies and state-sponsored educational institutions one of the most important ministries at the court. There was a famous saying recorded in the Chun Qiu Zhuo Zhuan, or Master Zhuo's Spring and Autumn Chronicle, Guo Zhi Da Shi Zai Shi Yong, meaning the most important state affairs are ritual ceremonies and military campaigns. If you know anything about Confucianism, you probably would have guessed that the ritual ceremonies were of instrumental value to the establishment of social hierarchy. Ritual ceremonies played a critical role in consolidating the legitimacy of a dynasty, while military campaigns were essential in expanding and defending the empire's territory. It is quite interesting that Wen Zhao held positions in both the Department of Military Affairs 
as well as the Department of Rights. We don't know when Wen Zhao adopted Wen Tingjun, but since Wen Zhao was already a high-ranked official when Wen Tingjun was in his late 20s, it should not be difficult for Wen Zhao to get Wen Tingjun to pass the civil service examination and find a position for him. However, as I have presented in my earlier video, Wen Tingjun never passed the exam, but was also not punished for his misconducts at the civil service examinations. It was also recorded in an unofficial history, Yu Quan Zi, or Master Jet Spring, that a retired official named Yao Xu recognized Wen Tingjun's talent and sponsored him for his study. But Wen Tingjun spent all Yao Xu's donated money for entertainment and visiting the brothels. Yao Xu was so angry and disappointed that he beat Wen Tingjun up around 855 AD at the age of 55, Wen Tingjun met a girl named Yu Youwei, who changed her name to Yu Xuanji when she became a Taoist nun. Yu Xuanji shown her poetic talent since she was very young, and she loved Wen Tingjun's poetry. Wen Tingjun started instructing her poetry while he was at Chang'an between 855 to 858 AD. Yu Xuanji fell in love with Wen Tingjun, but Wen Tingjun felt that she was too young for him and introduced her to a young scholar named Li Yi, who later took her in as his concubine. But Li Yi's wife found out their affair and beat Yu Xuanji up. So Yu Xuanji left Li Yi and retreated to a Taoist temple and became a Taoist nun. About 10 years later, Yu Xuanji accidentally killed her maid because she suspected that the maid was having an affair with one of her lovers. When Yu Xuanji's crime was exposed, she was executed by the then mayor of the capital named Wen Zhang. Guess who was Wen Zhang? Well, he was the only son of Wen Tingjun's adaptive father. Apparently, Wen Zhang's career path was much easier than that of Wen Tingjun. He joined the bureaucratic rank and rose quickly to the position of the mayor of the capital in 867 due to his father Wen Zhao's connections. When Yu Xuanji's case was presented to Wen Zhang, he sentenced her to death. I mean, I'm not saying Yu Xuanji should not be punished for her crime. She should. However, according to the Tang Dynasty law, if a master or a mistress killed a servant when the servant was at a fault, she or he should be lashed a hundred times. If the servant was killed for no reason, the master or mistress should be sentenced for one year labor. Yu Xuanji was punished much harsher than the law required. Wen Tingjun's connection with Yu Xuanji was well known at the time. However, Wen Zhang showed no mercy on Yu Xuanji, although she was the disciple of his adopted brother. Yu Xuanji was one of the few no female poets from the Tang Dynasty, and she had a fascinating life. I'm certainly going to make a video about Yu Xuanji and her poetry in the future. As you can see, the family Wen Tingjun grew up was a rather complicated one. Wen Tingjun lost his father when he was very young. His adoptive father did little to raise him to be a decent scholar, and he probably did not enjoy a good relationship with his adopted brother Wen Zhang. Furthermore, unlike his handsome ancestor Wen Yanbo, Wen Tingjun was supposedly very ugly. He was given the nickname of Zhong Kui by his friends. Zhong Kui was the Taoist god who can ward off all ghosts and evil spirits simply by his fierce and ugly look. 
It is an interesting fact that appearance mattered quite a lot when it came to recruiting officials during Imperial China. The poem we are looking at today is in the title of Pu Sa Man, which is the name of a popular melody. This poem is quite popular and has become one of the best known Tang poem since it was used in the most popular costume drama, Zhen Huan Zhuan, premiered in 2011. Even more than 10 years later, this is still one of the most popular drama among the Chinese speaking communities around the world. Here is the link to the song, sung by a royal concubine. Now, let me read the poem in Chinese first. Xiao Shan Chong Die Jin Ming Mie Bin Yun Yu Du Xiang Shai Xue Lan Qi Hua E Mei Nong Zhuang Shu Xi Chi Zhao Hua Qian Hou Jing Hua Mian Jiao Xiang Ying Xin Tie Xiu Luo Ru Shuang Shuang Jin Zhe Gu Now, let me translate the poem character by character. Xiao means small, San means mountain, Xiao San means small mountain. There are many different interpretations of Xiao San. Some say it was the mountain painted on the screen by the bed, which was quite common during the Tang Dynasty, as shown in this painting from the 10th century. On the left, we can see the back of part of the screen, which continues to the other two sides of the bed, where we can see the front with mountain painted on them. Others argue that Xiao San refers to the eyebrow style popular at the time. Here are paintings showing different eyebrow styles of the Tang. The two paintings on the left are the Xiao San style. Still others argue that Xiao San refers to the ceramic pillows in a mountain shape as shown here. David and I tend to believe the first interpretation that Xiao San refers to the screen by the bed. Professor Ye Jiaying, a specialist on Tang and Shong Dynasty poetry, offers detailed arguments for this view. She argues that there are similar phrases such as Shan Ping in Li Shangyin's poem. Another textual evidence is what followed Xiao Shan, that is, Chong Die, meaning folded away. Apparently, neither the eyebrows nor the ceramic pillows can be folded away. Only the screen can be folded away. Jin refers to the golden flower painted on a lady's forehead as shown here. Ming means bright. Mi means put out. Ming Mie here is used to describe the flickering light reflected from the golden flower painted on the lady's forehead. Bin refers to temple. Yun means cloud. Bin Yun refers to the thick hair on the temples. Yu means it's about to, Du means cross, Xiang means fragrant, Sai means cheek, Xue means snow. Xiang Sai Xue refers to the fragrant and snow white cheeks of the lady. It has been the Asian aesthetic view even since the Tang Dynasty more than 1200 years ago, that the fair skin is regarded as more beautiful than the dark skin. Lan qi hua e mei nong zhuang shu ying chi. Lan means indolent. Qi means rice. Hua means paint. E mei is an eyebrow style that looks like this. Nong means play. Zhuang means make up, Shu means comb, Xi means wash, Chi means slowly. Nong Zhuang Shu Xi is a description about the lady's morning routine of washing up, putting on makeup, and getting dressed. So the four lines can be translated as the golden flower on the lady's forehead flickers as the screen is folded away. 
Her cloud-like hair is about to sweep across her fragrant snow-white cheeks. She indolently rises, paints her eyebrows, dresses, and washes slowly. 照花前后镜，花面交相映。照 means reflect. 花 either refers to the flowery hairpin or flower that the lady used to decorate her hair. David and I think the flowery hairpin makes more sense. 前 means front. 后 means behind. 镜 means mirror. 花 means flowery hairpin again. 面 means Face, 交相 means against each other. 映 means reflect. 新贴绣罗襦，双双金鹧鸪。新 means new. 贴绣 is an ancient embroidery method that first makes an embroidery on a piece of fabric and then sew it onto a piece of clothes. The method is still used among the southwest minority. Communities at Guizhou Province. It is a bit like quilting, but with embroidery pieces. Luo refers to fine silk. I have made a short video about the different kind of silk, where I explain the different kind of silk. Here is the link. Ru means blouse. Shuang means a pair. For instance, you can say yi shuang xie. A pair of shoes. When the character "shuang" is used in a pair as "shuang shuang," it emphasizes on the action of pairing up. So it is not just a pair of bird as used here, but a pair of bird that they have paired up as a couple. Here, the pair of birds is the symbol of romantic love. Jin means gold. Zhe gu means patriot. I think I posted a few pictures about Jiegu and and explain what's the culture meaning of the bird. You can check those out. So the four lines can be translated as: Her flowery hairpin is in the mirrors in front and behind, reflects against her beautiful face. Her new blouse fits snugly, embroidered with a pair of golden patches. The poem starts by describing a lady who is woken up by her maid folding away the screen in front of her bed. The morning sun shines on the golden flower she painted on her forehead last night, indicating she had a big event last night. That is why she gets up so late. Of course, she is extremely beautiful. Her hair is as thick as the floating clouds. Her cheeks as white as snow. Slowly, she paints her eyebrow in the latest fashion, having her maid holding mirrors in front and back. She checks her flowery hairpin against her face. The newly made blouse fits her snugly. The pair of the embroidered patches reminded her the man she loves. We do not know when this poem was composed, but this poem is one of the poems composed for the then premier Lin Hu Tao, who presented them to Emperor Li Chen as his own between 850 to 859 A.D. So I guess this poem was intended for a court lady to sing for the Emperor Li Chen to express her love for the emperor. It is quite interesting that this poem is used in exactly the same scenario in the 2011 costume drama *Zhen Huan Zhuan*, where the royal concubine sang the lyrics for the emperor. It is hard to imagine that a poem composed more than a thousand years ago has no trouble to fit in with the drama made today. This is probably just another unique quality of the Tang poetry. Its beauty is timeless. Please let me know how you feel about this poem and the song in the drama. I'm Dr. Gao, a philosopher obsessed with poetry. I make videos about the classical Chinese poetry, philosophies, and medical literature. If you like the content of my videos. 
please click the like button and subscribe my channel. I also offer online lessons on these subjects. So if you would like to learn more about these subjects, please contact me. Here's my email address. Thanks for watching my video. I'll see you next time.